The following podcast is a ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church. Hear now the word of the Lord as it is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, beginning at verse 26. What then, brothers? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at most three And each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. And let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all be encouraged. And the spirit of the prophets are subject to prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Now, as in all the churches of the saints, uh, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or was it from you that the word of God first came? Are you the only ones that it is reached? If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or is spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. So my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy. And do not forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be done decently and in order. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One of the Puritans that I love to read... did more than a dozen sermons just on this small portion of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. So, if we're going to ever get to our picnic this afternoon, and if we're going to have dinner tonight, I'm going to really have to compress all of the rich biblical theology that lies in this portion of God's Word. Let's pray that, uh, that we actually get to lunch. But even more than that, uh, that we actually lay hold of what it is that the Lord has to teach us in this passage. Father, we do thank you for your word, for its richness, for its fullness, for the fact that uh, a first glance is not sufficient. Enable us to read, to hear, to believe, and to do. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. R.C. Sproul, in his extraordinary book on worship entitled A Taste of Heaven, says this. In the first chapter of Romans, the Apostle Paul makes it clear that the universal sin, the most fundamental sin among human beings, is idolatry. It is the proclivity to exchange the glory of God for a lie and to worship and serve the creature rather than the ever-blessed creator. Through the indictment of Romans 1, we learn that all human beings repress the manifest self-disclosure of God and refuse to honor him as God, nor are we grateful. These twin acts of treason against the divine glory, refusing to honor God as God and refusing to give him the gratitude that is his due, are so powerful that once a person is converted, these penchants are not instantly or automatically erased. Now, to be sure, Sproul says, uh, the Spirit of God quickens within the souls of the redeemed a new desire for worship, 
But that desire is not something that can be left to the natural course of experience. It must be cultivated. It must be learned in accordance with the directives of sacred scripture. The worship to which we are called in our renewed state is far too important to be left to personal preferences or whims or to marketing strategies. It is the pleasing of God that is at the heart of worship, not the pleasing of ourselves. Therefore, our worship must be informed at every point by the word of God as we seek God's own instructions for worship that is pleasing to him. The Corinthian church was deeply troubled in a whole host of ways, as we have seen over the last several weeks. Uh, There were controversies that abounded. Uh, There were divisions and factions and dissensions. There was rampant immorality. There were aberrant views of marriage and singleness, of gender and of sexuality. (coughs) Sound familiar? But chief among the problems, the Apostle Paul makes plain, was the fact that the Corinthians were undertaking worship their way rather than God's way. And so he begins, verse 26, with this this declaratory exclamation, What then, brothers? Uh, This is an expression of dismay of incredulity, and this is not the first time that he's had to express a dismay. He was dismayed in chapter 1 by the divisions and factions within the church. He was dismayed in chapter 5 by the unchecked immorality in the church. But earlier in this chapter, in chapter 14, he was dismayed, and he finally just simply says, stop thinking like children. In a sense, this opening exclamation is the Apostle Paul saying to the Corinthians and saying to us, stop it. What are you thinking? The problem was that that their worship uh, was a grandiose display of uh, their own personal preferences. Uh, Matthew Henry puts it this way. In this passage, the apostle reproves the Corinthians for their disorder. For they had introduced utter confusion into the assembly by the ostentation of their gifts. Each one confounding all the parts of worship in a perfect uproar. So he undertakes to correct them in the way of true God honoring worship. He says that when you come together in the assembly, one of you has hymns, that each of you has lessons, each of you brings revelations, each of you brings tongues. Sometimes there's an interpretation, sometimes not. Literally, he's saying, There are psalms and there's teaching, there's exhortation, there are uh, languages. Uh, Sometimes uh, there are interpretations, sometimes there are not. In other words, uh, worship was a free-for-all, full of chaos, confusion. It was cacophonous. They uh, took the ordinary means of grace but they applied them in a disordered fashion. And so Paul says in verse 26, let all things be done. The Greek word here is a word that means organized, ordained, ordered. Let all things be ordered for building up. Now this is a theme that runs all through the New Testament. Uh, The idea that all of our gifts, all of our callings, our worship should build up the flock. In Romans 14, Paul says, uh, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual 
upbuilding. In Romans 15, he writes, uh, let each of us care for his neighbor uh, for his good to build him up. In 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul writes, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up. Peter says it this way, all of you bless and edify uh, for uh, to this you were called. 1 Peter chapter 4, he says it this way, use your gifts to serve one another. Already in this chapter, uh, Paul has said that teaching and exhorting is for upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. And and again, he said, the use of all gifts is so that the church may be built up. So here in verses 27 through 31, Paul gives guidelines for ordered worship for the upbuilding of the flock. And the first thing to notice is that Paul does not diminish at all the need for this upbuilding to be established on the foundation of mutual every member ministry. The idea of the priesthood of all believers. He wants to affirm that all of the gifts of all of the body should be applied, should be exercised, should bear fruit for upbuilding. Now, after all, as Revelation chapter 1 says, Jesus has made us to be a kingdom of priests to God the Father. And so, notice in this short span, this little section, Paul uses the word each three times, and all three times. He wants us to know that even as worship must be ordered, it needs to be ordered in accordance with the gifts of the whole body. Ministry is not merely done by hired holy men like Brian. It's to be exercised by all of us. We are all called to it. But uh, notice, he says uh, that there has to be order in the way that we do this. Uh, We have to take turns, verse 27. That we have to be understood, verse 28. We have to exercise silence at various times when it is appropriate, verses 28 and 30. But only two or three uh, must... uh, Uh, must exercise those gifts, verse 29, and those uh, must be fully accountable to uh, the elders, verse 29. If there is no interpretation, uh, then uh, other languages should not be used, verse 30. We have to go one by one, verse 31, so that, Paul says, all may learn and all may be encouraged, verse 31. In verse 32, he underlines the fact that worship is not simply an impulsiveness that comes upon us by the Spirit. It is deliberative. It is accountable. He makes it plain that Spirit-led worship is under control. It is not merely an ecstatic, metaphysical utterance. And the reason for that, verse 33, is simply that this reflects the character and nature of God. Paul says, God is not a God of confusion. The word that's used here is the same word and then the Septuagint is used in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, where we're told that the earth, that the world, that all of creation was formless and void. God is an ordering, creating God. He is not a God of formlessness. He is not a God who is void of content. He is not a God of confusion. In other words, what Paul is pointing to here is the fact that that God established in creation certain ordinances. Uh, the, uh, the 
ordinances of Genesis 1 and 2 are profound. This is the way God intended the world to be, how the world was to function. Now, chapter 1, verse 1, here we see proclaimed the preeminence of the Creator, Bereshith, Bacha, Elohim. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 1 uh, it tells us uh, that our God is sovereign. And then verse 2, we see the creator-creature distinction. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the Spirit of the Lord was hovering over the formless and void roiling creation. In verse 4, uh, we see the pro-existence of God. He looks at all that he has created and he says, it is good. In verse 20, we see uh, the sacred teeming, uh, the swarms uh, that uh, creation brings upon the earth. In verse 26, we see the imago dei, uh, that man is made in God's image. In verse 27, uh, that image bearing man is made both male and female. In verse 28, uh, they are brought together in a covenant union covenant union of marriage to be fruitful and multiply. In verse 28, uh, they are given a mandate uh, to subdue, to exercise dominion, uh, to uh, to work and to keep, uh, to exercise stewardship over all of creation. In chapter 2, verse 3, we have the ordinance of Sabbath rest. In chapter 2, verse 4, we have uh, the idea of linear history, a history that has a beginning, a history that has an end. Uh, We have uh, the beginning of the generations, the toldos. These are creation ordinances. In other words, when God created the world, he intended that the world should operate in accordance with these essential standards. Look, there are only two genders. That's what God intended. God is God and we are not That is what God intended. At the fall, God's order was disordered. The relationship between Adam and Eve was suddenly sundered. The relationship between Adam and Eve and creation was suddenly sundered. Uh, Suddenly, the the, the labor that they were to undertake to exercise stewardship over the earth is fraught with difficulty, sweat of the brow, thorns in the ground, weeds in the garden. And the whole world was brought under a curse. But God's intentions for what was right and good and true never changed. God is not a God of confusion. Therefore, what Paul is saying is is that our worship needs to reflect those creation ordinances. That's the essential principle. But he doesn't stop with the creation ordinances, does he? Uh, Notice, he says, God is not a God of confusion, but he is a God of peace. You probably know that the biblical concept of peace is not simply the absence of conflict or the absence of war. It is making right every broken thing. It is building bridges of reconciliation. It is making whole again those things which have been shattered and disordered. The Bible tells us In the eternal decrees of God, he had a plan. A plan for reordering the disordered world caused by the fall. In Colossians chapter 1, Paul says, God has through Jesus reconciled to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. God is not a God of confusion. He is a God of peace. 
Ephesians chapter 2, Jesus himself is our peace, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. That is the brokenness of the law of commandments ordained in ordinances, thus making peace that he might reconcile all things to God through the cross. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 Through Christ, God reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God made peace, reconciling the world to himself, not counting trespasses against us. See what Paul is doing here? He's laying out the foundations for good biblical theology. God made the world right and good and true. The fall unmade the world's order. Therefore, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have the promise of the reordering, the healing, the restoration of every broken thing. Jesus has come to make his blessings flow as far as the curse is found. Paul says, our worship should reflect these two fundamental truths. The creation ordinances, the way God intended the world in the first place, and the redemptive work of Jesus, uh, which equips and enables that reordering process in our hearts, in our lives, in our worship, and in our world. This is heavy-duty theology. So, in verses 33 through 36, Paul gives an example. And for us, it's bound to be problematical. Women in worship. What do we do with the woman, Adam said? Now, you can only imagine the kind of exegetical and theological gymnastics uh, that various commentators have attempted to use in order to explain this passage. After all, the language that has a bit of a serrated edge for us. So some commentators have suggested that uh, Corinth was a special case. Uh, They had a lot of busybodies, a lot of gossips, Uh, It was a church filled with the church lady. (laughs) But others that have said it was a special case that that Corinth uh, was riven with false teachers, Jezebels. That, That therefore Paul is making a special case to try and stop that in its tracks. Both of those interpretations say... We, we, sophisticated folk, we we don't need to worry about this. It was all for the Corinthians. Little problem, though. And that is, Paul says, as in all the churches. And then, he uses reasoning that parallels what he writes to his disciple, Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, where he makes it plain that because of the creation ordinances and the disordering that occurred at the fall with Adam and Eve, in the church, pastors must be men. In order to preach and teach, in order to exercise authority, pastors must be men. Paul follows that same reasoning here. The words may rankle at first, but listen to what Paul says. Women should keep silent. They're not permitted to speak. They must be in submission as the law says. Now here, uh, Paul uses uh, law in the same way that he's used it all the way throughout 1 Corinthians, meaning the whole Old Testament. But very likely that as... uh, as he unfolds his argument, he's referring back to those creation ordinances. He's thinking about Adam and Eve. He's thinking about uh, the 
authority uh, that Adam was to bear up. And then he says, if a woman wishes to learn, let her ask her husband. Now, uh, we must make note of several things here. First of all, in chapter 7, uh, Paul has already acknowledged that there were a number of women in the church who had no husbands. Uh, there were singles. There were widows. Paul deals with that. So it's very likely that we need to adjust what we're hearing the Apostle Paul say in light of the fact that not everybody has a husband to go and ask. Uh, secondly, it's really interesting In chapter 11, verse 5, Paul makes special provisions for women who pray and prophesy in worship services that they must be accountable, that, that they must bear the marks of authority, that they must be ordered. So the first thing that we have to realize is Paul is not talking about a universal gag order. He's not saying that every female who walks into a chapel has to wear a muzzle. He's not saying that. What he is saying is made plain in this next statement, which parallels 1 Timothy chapter 2. Was it from you that the word of God first came? He's referring back to the creation ordinances. He's talking about creation order. He's talking about roles for the various genders. He's talking about calling. He's making it plain that women are not to exercise authority in the church. And this is emphasized even more by the fact uh, that here there are actually two words in verse 34 uh, that are used for the word speak or speech. Uh, One, uh, where it says, as the law says, is the word that simply means speak or speech. The, The other, a woman must not be allowed to speak it is shameful for a woman to speak, is a special word that literally means declarative speech. In other words, Paul is saying, pastors must be men. The teaching must be men. And this is why he refers it back to the creation ordinances. He refers it back to the Adam and Eve argument that Paul uses in 1 Timothy chapter uh, 2. So in that light, he says, it is shameful, verse 35, for a woman to speak. Literally, it is improper. It is a violation of the natural order. It's a violation of the creation ordinances. It's not a gag order. It's not the muzzling or the refusal of the gifts of women in the church to be properly exercised. It's simply a proper ordering of worship. Paul says in verses uh, 37 and 38, look, uh, this is non-negotiable. This is a command from the Lord, and it must be recognized. Then in verse 39, Paul ends the chapter where the chapter begins. Simply saying, earnestly desire the gifts. In fact, don't even forbid those extraordinary manifestations of various gifts. And then in verse 40, he ends this uh, chapter where the section begins, saying that all must be done decently and in order. The Greek word for decently here is a word that means properly or becomingly or decorously or artfully. He's saying uh, worship should be delightful. It's not decent uh, simply in the moral sense. Uh, uh, Worship uh, needs to fill our souls with joy. It needs to be proper. It needs to be filled with reverence and awe. 
The second word uh, that is used here uh, for uh, in order is a Greek word that is actually a military term. It, uh, it, it literally means uh, to be in military formation, uh, to be in military array. It's a reminder to us uh, that worship is actually warfare. It's war against the sin in our own hearts. It's war against the sin in our world. It's war against a false teaching. It's war against the notion uh, that uh, truth is truth no matter how much it may hurt. It's a reminder to us that uh, we are to do what we do in an orderly fashion because souls are at stake. Lives are at stake. Eternity is at stake. So Paul says, uh, worship must be done decently and in order. Now what Paul is teaching us here is uh, uh, quite extraordinary. First, he's reminding us that true worship must be biblical in both its forms and its content, bringing hymns or psalms, lessons or teaching, revelation or exhortation. Uh, The ordinary means of grace must be applied. Secondly, true worship, he's reminding us, must be for the upbuilding of the whole congregation. Third, Uh, True worship uh, must be a function of the priesthood of all believers uh, and the multiplicity of gifts applied in the body. Fourth, true worship must be orderly, like a military array or an artful display. Uh, Fifth, uh, true worship must be submitted to the creation ordinances and to the law. Sixth, True worship must be rooted in the character and nature of God himself, who is both creator and redeemer. Our worship should reflect the way that God intends the world to be, and it should reflect the glory and the wonder of the redemption of Jesus for sinners like us. R.C. Sproul, in his wonderful book, says this, In our time, we have experienced a profound loss of the sense of the holy. And with that, any sense of the gravity and seriousness of godly worship. We are a people who have lost the threshold and have failed to make a transition on Sunday morning from the secular to the sacred, from the common to the uncommon, from the profane to the holy. We continue, as did the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, to offer strange fire before the Lord. We have made our worship services more secular Secular than sacred, more common than uncommon, more profane than holy. God have mercy on us all. As the Westminster Confession of Faith says, the acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by God Himself. And so is limited by His own revealed will that he may not be worshipped according to the imaginations and devices of men or any other way not prescribed in Holy Scripture. As the writer to the Hebrews has said, we have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Therefore, let us offer him acceptable worship with reverence and awe. This has been the Parish Presbyterian Church Sermon Podcast. For more information about the ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church, please visit www.parishpres.org.